Ever wondered what God looks like? I know I have. I know as far back as I can remember, I've wondered. But I've never been satisfied with where it got me. I've thought of God as an old man, a nice grandfather figure, but one who's a tad fragile, not someone who can defend me when I'm threatened. I feared him as a strict principal, an ever-present policeman who was always nagging on me and just waiting to thumb me as the guy who did it. I once considered him to be my good luck charm. All I had to do was call on him and hopefully he would come serve me and give me what I want, my own personal genie in a bottle. I even pictured him as an absent landlord, someone I have to pay rent to, and frankly, probably someone who has a lot better things to do than bother with me. And I've imagined him other ways, but all my images of God are just too small. All of them, that is, except one. God has told us in the Bible that he is spirit. It does not detail his physical appearance. And in fact, it reminds us that no man has seen God at any time. But the Bible also tells us something else. It tells us that God became flesh. It tells us that Jesus makes it known what God is like. That he is the visible image of the invisible God. That in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. It tells us that Jesus himself said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. If you know me, you know my Father. The Bible also says that Jesus' body was not stately in form or appearance that we should be attracted to him. But his person, wow, talk about attractive. When you talk about the person of Jesus, you don't find yourself talking about his strong points. You marvel that he is the exact representation of the nature of God. Every good attribute and characteristic of perfection was seen in Jesus. Want to know what God looks like? Then take a look at Jesus. See how he handles the oppressed. Watch how Jesus pursues those that are lost. Notice how he deals tenderly with friends. Be amazed at how he loves and offers forgiveness to his enemies. Look at how he stands strong in the face of death. Notice how he sacrifices himself for the good of others. Watch how he respects those in authority and yet how he bows to no one. Observe how he handles hypocrites, betrayal, and deceit. Look at his response to dead religion, burdensome traditions, and the arrogance of men. And yet, notice how children run to him. Watch him serve his world and lead his men. Always loving, never failing, continually forgiving. Want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. We're going to look to Jesus today. And I want to begin that journey by looking at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. See if you have a copy of God's Word or there in the pew racks in front of you. Uh, Your electronic version of God's Word. We're looking at Matthew 16 verse 13. And here's, here's how Matthew records the story. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter replied, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one he was the Christ. Oh, there was a time coming when they would be charged with telling that story. Now, this is the question of our time. And the question of our time, who is Jesus? And what we find most of the time is that if you ask people, so who is Jesus, These, you, get, you get the fun size version of Jesus or the, the downsized version, the, the marginalized version of Jesus, minimized in importance. So Jesus, he's at Caesarea Philippi with his disciples when he does this little public opinion survey. Who, who are people saying that I am? Now he chose as always with great wisdom, where things would happen, not just what would happen, but where it would happen. 
And uh, this was a good spot, Caesarea Philippi. This was examination time because these disciples, they've been, they've been listening to Jesus. They have seen him do the amazing things that he has done. And now Jesus wants to just test the waters after teaching time. There's an examination time. And Caesarea Philippi was a good place to do some examining. I have a couple of pictures of Caesarea Philippi. The first one, this is, this is uh, about what it looks like today if you were to visit Caesarea Philippi, way up in the north, uh, the, what we would call the Holy Land. Uh, that's a picture of Caesarea Philippi. You see, you see some caves, some indentions. Uh, there are all kinds of ruins at Caesarea Philippi. Uh, we have another picture. This is an artist's conception of what it would have looked like maybe in Jesus' day. So Caesarea Philippi, it's largely a Gentile area. You're, you're not just forever away from Jerusalem in the heart of uh, the Israelites. But uh, it's a little more loose up this way. There are a lot of other things competing for attention of people. And so what you have, uh, we believe, you know, in the middle there is a temple dedicated to the Roman. This is Caesarea Philippi. Uh, Philip had built a monument, a temple, a place of worship for uh, the Roman emperor, the Caesar, and Caesarea Philippi. Over on the left-hand side of that, you see another place. The Greeks believe the god Pan was born in this cave, and that temple is dedicated to him. There's some around 14 different uh, shrines, small temples, places of worship for the Syrian god Baal. We see, I hear a lot about Baal in the Old Testament. It's a fertility cult, very dark and, uh, and sinful. A lot of other stuff going on. Uh, the picture we saw at first, where you saw the water uh, flowing out. See, we're looking to the north here. Mount Hermon is on beyond this uh, rock cliff, you see. And Mount Hermon snow-capped. As the snow melts, the water comes, goes underground, and it pops out at this spot forms the part of forming the headwaters of the Jordan River sacred to the people of God. So there are all kinds of reasons this is a religious center. So there's a pretty good population in Caesarea Philippi, but this is a destination for religious seekers of any uh, variety. Most of the things around the disciples when Jesus asked this question, just representative of a world that is going to follow something going to worship someone, something, a personality, a deity, a thing that claims uh, worship, claims for commitment. And against this backdrop, with all these different choices, this cafeteria style, you can worship anything, anywhere, anytime. Jesus says, who, do, who are people saying that I am? And the disciples give three quick answers. They say, well, some say... Some say John the Baptist. John the Baptist has been killed uh, at this point uh, for his stand. Uh, John the Baptist, if you're identified with John the Baptist, you're in you're, you're a pretty good spot. John the Baptist was a person that called people to turn from their sin, pointed them toward the kingdom of God. Uh, he, he, he took on, took on the authorities around him and wasn't afraid to speak God's truth. Being identified with John the Baptist is a pretty good identification. Well, some people say you're like Elijah. Now, Elijah, fiery prophet of God, uh, taking on government structures himself. He's, a, he's also a miracle worker, a man of great prayer. I can see how they could identify Jesus with Elijah. Some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Well, Jeremiah, Jeremiah always faithful in spite of opposition. No matter how hard it got, Jeremiah was going to remain true to the Lord. And, we see some of that in, in Jesus. All good. On this occasion, they didn't share what everyone was saying. Because we learned from the Gospels that there were also people who said, He is definitely not from God. Others said, went, went another step, We believe He's demon-possessed. There were, in fact, members of His own family who said, We just think He's out of His mind. Uh, pretty rough. They didn't throw those on the table, though that was uh, swirling around the story of Jesus too. See, it's possible for people to have all kinds of good thoughts about Jesus, but never quite have it right. To have a high opinion of Jesus, but not quite high enough. 
uh, in, in our conversations, we've been going out into our city and, and just sharing testimony, praying for folks. We've gotten a lot of different responses, really the same kind of responses. Jesus, great guy, nice guy, good teacher, fine moral example. Jesus is good for a good quote, sound bite. But with all these things that aren't just terrible things, it's still not, not embracing who Jesus really was. It's denying the fullness of Jesus' person, Jesus' character. He is Savior. He is Lord. You've, uh, you've probably heard the word theology, theos, God, and ology means a, a concept, a word, uh, a teaching. So theology, a teaching about God. And under theology, there are a lot of other ologies that we study. There's uh, eschatology, study of end times, ecclesiology, study of the church. But out of all those ologies, the most important of those ologies is Christology, the, the study, the doctrine of Christ. And, and the foundation stone, I believe, for the doctrine of Christ, your Christology is Jesus is God. And if you end up somewhere besides that, if your Christology isn't right on point, then then all your other ologies are going to unravel. And, and everything about relationship to God and what it ought to look like and how it ought to fit together, they're all going to start coming apart. Jesus is God. The Apostle Paul, he was, he was writing some folks in a church in Colossae in uh, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And uh, there was some false teaching out there, some distortions about Jesus. People were talking about Jesus, but they were, seemed to be redefining him, uh, downsizing, fun-sizing Jesus. And Paul writes this beautiful description, a powerful, uh, defining description. This is Jesus. And uh, I want to share that with you as we look again at Jesus today from Colossians chapter 1. You can circle back to Caesarea Philippi in just a moment. Here's what Paul wrote in Colossians 1 verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things are created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. There's a pastor who had a tradition like we have a tradition of having a children's sermon. Those of you who have followed me in children's sermons recognize the adventure that we face together. Uh, sometimes it all just goes the way I want it to, and sometimes they can run right out from under you. Sometimes you get a lot of participation, sometimes not nearly enough. And this particular pastor, he was, wanted to give an illustration about uh, just commitment and hard work and perseverance, and he wanted to use a, a squirrel as his example. So he said to the children, okay, now what is kind of furry and brown, small, and has a big bushy tail? Nothing. Okay, um, it likes to scurry around the ground, uh, gather up acorns, and climb trees. I appreciate that. 
That's one of you out of all of you. <laughs> Finally, one of the older girls raised her hand. Oh, I'm off the hook. And he called on her and she said, Pastor, I know that when you ask questions in church, the right answer is always Jesus, but it sure does sound like you're talking about a squirrel. <laughs> now, honestly, the right answer to just a whole lot of questions in life is just going to be Jesus. Over and over and over again, it's going to be Jesus. Who is Jesus? And I want to run through some things here that the Apostle Paul declares so beautifully. Here's the first one. Jesus is the God revealer. And too many people have this watered-down, benign picture of Jesus. That was the case with the people in, in uh, the Colossians was written to. People were thinking, Jesus is a great guy, fine example, good moral teacher. But that's all. The Bible tells a different story. Colossians says, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Paul wrote, he is the image of the invisible God. He's the perfect representation of God. This uh, last week, we did a family picture. I mean, multiple generations family picture. I don't know if you've done much of that, but it can be a real adventure. It, it reminded me, uh, my, my grandparents, and this is quite a few years ago now because my children were preschoolers at the time, we did the big family picture for their 50th wedding anniversary. They wanted all of us together. So my mom, her sister, her brother, and all of their children, and then grandchildren, my grandparents' great-grandchildren, we all gathered up. And so it's a crowd, and it, you're trying to get every, the preschoolers just, just focusing on something. So you're doing the photographer, a professional photographer. We were outside. This is in, in Arkansas, so it's a primitive camera. No, not really. I don't know. <laughs> Pick on you, Arkansas people. I have too, too many roots there. Um, and so here we are. We're trying to take this picture. Multiple times, you know, and kids are crawling all over, and you're trying to get, look, look over here. Look, 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 look. Uh, so my grandparents, after all these proofs, they finally got the picture back. Uh, that they chose as their favorite, and uh, they uh, sent out copies to all of us. So when it was coming, when it came, what do, you, what do you do when there's a group picture? Who do you look at first? Yourself. Yeah. Not me. I'm a good, better parent than y'all are. So I looked at my kids first. <laughs> and uh, now, so in this picture, you start scanning this crowd of preschoolers and elementary school age, and then, you know, all of us adults, and my grandparents are sitting in the middle of this swarm of people. And uh, every preschooler, just dead on with a camera, smiling. It was awesome. There was one problem. With the, the reason this is picture is nowhere in our home. Because of me. <laughs> Out of all of this, I had this... Uh, there used to be a TV show called My Name is Earl, and Earl never could keep his eyes open in a picture. And, and so that was me. <laughs> I like that. And I really wanted to call the photographers out of all those proofs. I'm telling you, this picture does not do me justice. The, the, only, the only fear I had was that he would say, sorry, I watched you during this whole photography session. You don't need justice. You need mercy. Uh, <laughs> So, God chose to reveal himself to us, to make himself known. Uh, he put on flesh and walked in our midst. No one has ever seen God, the Bible says, but a whole lot of people saw Jesus. And when they saw Jesus, they said, that's who God is. That's how God would do it. That's what he would be like. People have all these opinions. Well, you know, the God I believe in, he'd do this. The God I believe in wouldn't care about that. The God... When you see Jesus, you see a clear representation of this is God. This is what is important to him. This is what he would care about. This is how he would live his life. Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And when you see Jesus, you know his will. You know his ways. You know his character. And you know what he's expecting from you. John wrote, no one has ever seen God but the unique one, talking about Jesus, who himself is God, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Here's the second thing. Jesus is the world maker. At the time Paul wrote this letter, there were false teachers claiming Jesus is not God, just maybe a superhuman 
uh, very special person. And those people are still around who say, well, Jesus is extra, extra special. Something different than the rest of us maybe in many ways, but he's not God, less than God. The Bible says Jesus is here. Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. And we think about this in 21st century American mindset. And we say, oh, so he was born. He was a, he, this is some sort of biological process. He's a created being. But the people, in fact, both the Gentile and the Jewish audience that would have heard what Paul wrote to the Colossians, they would have understood firstborn had nothing to do with being born. It had to do with position. It had to do with privilege. Because the firstborn would inherit everything from the Father. And Jesus had a right, a claim to everything that belonged to God, including his deity. He is the firstborn over all creation. He is the, and also he is over creation, which means he's the king, he's the ruler, he's the master over all. Jesus was present and participating in the creation of the universe. Genesis records God saying, Let us make man in our own image, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all working together in this process of the creation of the world. Early church father Irenaeus said, Jesus Christ is the glove the Father puts on when he creates the world. The Bible says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, why is it a big deal that Jesus is a creator? Because you're never going to understand the reason you walk on the planet, the reason you draw breath today. You're never going to understand your purpose for life until you get to know the one who made you because nobody knows better than the creator why you were created. Here's why you were created. You were created to know God, to love God, and to serve God. And he already knows and loves you beyond what you could even imagine. If you miss this, you miss the reason you exist. He's the creator. By the way, I'm going to say something to you. Uh, I said this a few weeks ago, and it's just a little extra today. But uh, my right eye, it just gradually closes up on me. And uh, it's because I can't see out of my right eye. I had this surgery a while back. and Anyway, I had this crazy distortion going on. So it's not because I'm a bad winker. It's just because I uh, kind of have this uh, crazy, crazy view going. I have a bubble in my eye, and it kind of floats around like this. So if I look seasick, I I may be. So there you go. Here's the third thing. This is one of my favorites in this set. He's the life sustainer. Verse 17, this is one of my favorite parts of this whole passage. Jesus didn't just create the world and everything in it. He holds it all together. I like that part. He holds it all together. Where's your security in life? What are you afraid of in life? Fear not. He holds the world in his hands. He holds you in his hands. And he'll hold you together when you feel like your whole world is coming apart. Some of you walked in here on Easter Sunday. And there are things going on in your life. that It's just out of, it's just out of your control. And you feel like it's just out of control. And you're, not gonna, you're, trying, you're, just, you're treading water trying to keep your head above water. This has been a tough season uh, for our family in the last month. And, and he is the one who holds it all together and holds me together when I don't feel like I can hold me together. Now, on this point, I want to share this illustration. Uh, some of you have seen it because it's got a lot of play out on YouTube from uh, Louis Giglio. It's, uh, I always enjoy hearing Louis speak and a little inspirer, but he did a thing. He was talking about, uh, doing a talk about the, he holds it all, to, he holds it all together. And he used this as an illustration. He talked about uh, something called laminin, which I know, he's, well, yeehaw, uh, laminin, whatever that is. Well, here's the definition, scientific description of laminin. Laminins are a family of proteins that are an integral part of the structural scaffolding of basement membranes in almost every animal tissue. So see, this isn't just inspirational, it's also educational to come to church on Easter, right? Uh, yeah, so basically, laminins are what hold us together. They're uh, cell adhesion molecules. So it's what holds one cell to another cell. cell. So in, in a real way, it's, uh, it's just what keeps you from kind of unraveling as a, as a life form. And you go, okay, well, that's great. Uh, it, it got better when uh, 
I saw Louis, he, there's a picture, a science textbook. They just said, okay, this is what a laminin molecule looks like. And I want to tell you, this isn't evidence the Bible's true or, or God is real, but uh, what holds our body together is laminin. Colossians says Jesus holds all things together. I just want to show you the, the scientific structure of laminin. It's just kind of fun. Uh, sometimes God just throws out little things like that and go, yeah, there's something for you to think about. I just threw that one in in the mix just just. Just for fun. Just to remind you. Just to encourage you in some things. Not only is Jesus before all things. And over all things. And creator of all things. The Bible says in him. All things hold together. And he could hold it together for you. This is how he supports this claim. Jesus said. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. And I'll give you rest. And. You'll find rest for your souls. Jesus claims to possess power to calm the most, the most troubled heart. Philosophy, science, and technology will never promise you rest for your souls. Only Jesus can do that. When you read these verses in Colossians, you don't just discover doctrines about Jesus. You meet someone with unlimited power. Now, there's nothing too hard for him. It means you come to him with your most difficult problem, and Jesus won't say, man, that's above my pay grade. That's beyond what I can handle. You discover a Savior who can heal the brokenness of your life, your heart, a creator who can bring order out of the chaos that swirls around you, a ruler worthy to be praised, a God who's been around longer than time, and a friend who holds the universe together and your life together when you feel like you're coming apart. Here's the fourth thing from Colossians. Jesus is the relationship fixer. There are a lot of things that only Jesus is able to do. And reconciling sinners to God is one of those things. Bringing us together. We are separated from God by our sin and we need a reconciler. Sin separates us from God because all have sinned, the Bible tells us. And the Bible says this in 1 Peter, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. The great images of what takes place when Jesus pays the penalty for our sin. Sin separates us from God. Jesus creates peace with separated sinners and a holy God through his, as uh, Paul says in Colossians, his shed blood on the cross. He's a bridge to God. He's the only way to have a relationship to God, your sin to be forgiven, and to know one day you'll spend eternity in heaven. See, Jesus came, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came to this earth and he died on a cross to pay for our sin. And because he was God and because he was sinless, because of the distance between the glory of heaven and the suffering of the cross, that was sufficient to pay for the sins of the whole world for all time. He was placed in a tomb. And on the third day he was raised from the dead, which proved he's God. Because only God overcomes death. And he proved that what he did there, what he proved here, what he did there accomplished the mission and it was all paid and he offers us forgiveness of sin relationship eternal life in heaven now back to Caesarea Philippi so Jesus said who do men say that I am well public opinion survey but it never stopped. We love talking about what other people. Well, people say, I've heard they, whoever they are. But Jesus always makes it personal. It has to become personal for every one of us. But who do you say that I am? Well, just a prophet, just a teacher, a revolutionary. Peter broke the silence. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You can't believe anything you want to about Jesus, about salvation, about how you get to heaven. You can't believe anything you want to and still have forgiveness of sin, relationship to God, and eternal life in heaven. Jesus, the sinless Son of God, loves you. He died on a cross 
to pay for your sin. He was raised from the dead to prove the power of the cross. And he says, but who do you say that I am? If you have never given your life to Christ, and I'm talking about, back that up. I run into people all the time who say, oh yeah, I believe that. Oh yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I believe that. I've heard it my whole life. Sure, why not? I'm good with that. But they've never surrendered their life to Christ. People who've been in church their whole lives, people who've been baptized, confirmed, they have done, served, gone, they have this resume of religious activity. But honestly, it's never been personal surrender to Christ. And that's a step everybody has to take. It has to become personal and it has to show up in commitment. So Monday, this last Monday, I stood about this close to the edge of the stage at First Baptist Church, Beeville, Texas, uh, down uh, close to Corpus Christi. To preach my father-in-law's funeral. And I stood. And, I th and, and when I walked up. To begin. And I opened my Bible. I thought about where I was standing. My father-in-law. Who was quite a character. In all kinds of ways. Served that church for 33 years on their staff. Uh, he would have said. Chad has returned to the scene of the crime. <laughs> because. That was the spot I stood 32 years earlier when I, I exchanged vows with my wife, Rhonda, and we got married. And uh, I thought about that spot and that commitment again. It's the first time I'd stood at that spot since then. And uh, I've been to church plenty of times, but hadn't climbed up there to that, uh, that spot. See, Rhonda and I knew each other for... Uh, few years before we, a few months before we started dating, and then we dated, and then we were engaged, and, and then we got to that spot, and see, but we weren't married until, until, though I knew a lot about her, like a lot of people know about this, I made a commitment of my life to her, and, and, and I, I made some vows to her. That I've, I've tried to fulfill for these years since, and, and not always to perfection, but it's the leaning of my life, the desire of my heart. There was a time in my life when I was, I was well aware of this story and this story and how they all fit together. But there came a point where it had to be personal for me, and, and I surrendered my life to Jesus. And, and I, I verbalized my vow, my commitment to him as my savior and surrendered my life to him as the Lord of my life. Who do you say that I am, Jesus said. If you, if you, if you are not sure about that, if it's just, you've heard this story, but it's not settled for you. And here's what happens. When you do that surrender part, the direction of your life really changes. The, the trajectory of where you're going in life, it, it shifts when, when you do that surrender part. That makes it a big deal. I want to give you the opportunity to make the same kind of commitment, the same kind of expression to God that I made, that everybody has to make who, who begins a relationship to Christ. And I'm going to ask you to do something. Some of you, you've already done this before. You've made that commitment. But I want you just maybe as a vow renewal. How about that? I'm going to share that kind of commitment prayer. I'm going to invite all of you to say it with me. Some of you will say this for the first time. Some of you will nail this down for the first time. Some of you will just remember and celebrate what Christ has already done in your heart as we pray this. So I'm going to pray this out loud. I'm going to invite you. I'm going to say a, part, a little of it at a time. I want you to say it out loud with me uh, after after each phrase. We'll do it together. Let's bow our heads. If you'd like to begin that relationship to Christ, reaffirm that relationship to Christ. Maybe you would say, Dear God, 
I am sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. I turn from my sin. Today, I place all my faith in Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he was raised from the dead. Today, I commit my life to Jesus. Come into my life, Jesus. Take away my sin. I surrender my life to you. I will follow you with all my heart for the rest of my days. Thank you for this amazing gift. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. In 1 John, it says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Listen, religious stuff's not going to get you to heaven. Trying to be a good person, doing nice things for other people, not going to get you to heaven. There's only one way to say yes to Jesus who's already reaching out to you. Now, I want you to take that card that's in your program. I'd like for you to help me out with something. I, I w There's a gang of you here today, and I appreciate that. We had a great crowd at 730. We expecting a good group at 1030. Here's what I'd like for you to do on that card. I hope, uh, and, and really, we need everybody to fill it out because I'd love to sit down with all of you. Sit down and say, hey, so uh, tell me where you are in your relationship to God. How's that going? Where do you see yourself? But it's going to be a little hard to pull that off this morning, so I'd like for you to be able to share it with me in this way. Here's what I want you to do. A, B, C, D. It's just a simple way to communicate where things are. Here's the first one. A. A put an A on the top of your, your card if you say, I have already made that kind of commitment to Christ. There's a time in my life when I put all my faith in Christ as my one and only Savior, surrendered my life to Him. I've already done that, and I'm leaning into it. Pray for me that I can keep, keep running well and finish this race well with the Lord. Just A. B, somebody for the first time prayed that prayer that uh, we led in just a moment ago, and you said, today I am believing, B. I believe today I gave my life to Christ and I want somebody to know about it because I need some prayer for this. This is a big step for me. And I'm excited about it and I want to know about next steps. So B, today I am believing. Some of you, you've made that commitment, but you've never participated in believer's baptism, obedient to the Lord. You, you, I really want to be baptized. We're going to baptize the next hour. Baptism. The picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that my sins have been washed away. Uh, well, what a privilege. And you say, I'd like, to, I'd like to be baptized. Somebody call me about setting up a time to be baptized. Uh, just write baptized out beside that B. That'd help us out. C, this is a whole lot to throw at you on a Sunday morning. Some of you said, man, I came in kind of cold. And, and this is a lot to ask. And I don't know that I'm quite ready to make that believing commitment, surrender commitment, but... I don't know. Something stirs in my heart about this, and I'm C. I'm considering it. I'm thinking about it. Uh, maybe this is something God's God's working in in my life. And just pray for me as I as I explore this with this whole relationship to God. I'm considering this, and I have letter D because there has to be one more choice. And letter D is D. I don't ever intend to do this. I'm not believing it. I, I'm, I'm not, I, I think, I came because somebody asked me to, and, but I don't ever intend to do this. And I appreciate your honesty in that. But I have to have that in there because that's the only other direction we can go with that. A, B, C, D. Now, <laughs> uh, Peter didn't always get it right, but he got it right on this time. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And uh, you're Peter. And on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, you're, you're Peter, Petros. 
You're a little rock. I have this little rock I've been carrying in my pocket. You're a little rock. Now remember, he says it there. There are rocks everywhere. I picture Jesus picking up a little rock, and he said, you're Peter, little rock. On this rock, but he used a different word for rock. He used a, rock, he used a word for rock that refers to a strata of rock. Uh, a big old chunk, a cliff, a strata of rock, a foundation stone kind of on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter, this is you. Oh, but that faith, that faith thing, when you put your faith in Jesus, it's, it's not just me, little me trying to do what little me can do. It's this big foundation stone because it's built on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand, the hymn writer wrote. Solid rock. Here's what we want to do today. Keep thinking about that A, B, C, and D. Because some of you is going to process that. Some of you feels like life's falling apart. You need somebody to pray for you. And not just the prayer request you've recorded on that card. You need somebody to pray for you today. We're going to have members of our staff, other church leaders are going to be available if a lot of folks start coming down to pray for you and encourage you. Here's the other thing. We're going to have some buckets down here. And I know for the folks in the balcony, we'll wait for you on this. These buckets just full of little rocks. Because for me, I need a regular reminder I've found of a lot of things. One of them is when I'm frustrated, when I'm struggling, and I'm putting it all on me. Just a reminder, Chad, you really can't do this. You need, you need Jesus for everything, for every day. And just a reminder, take with you. Keep it in your pocket. Keep it somewhere where you're going to see it regularly. Put it on your desk. Put it on your nightstand. I need, I need something bigger than just little me. I need Jesus. That you'd be reminded to look to him in everything.